spring. Um, I'm over at Temple, so I'm not in liberal arts, but my own background is in liberal arts. And so one of my main interests is trying to democratize what some people see as a technology that is hard to sustain or too expensive, um, especially for small institutions. And that's just absolutely not true. There's a lot of wonderful pedagogical uses of written printing um, and a wide range of filaments, materials, um, Prices for 3D printers, and so it's something that is accessible and uh, possible for all institutions. Um, I do want to thank the Council Library Information Resources uh, to uh, have my fellowship with them. And this research comes largely from a project that I work with with a few other fellows um, that I'm developing on my own for 3D printing in a library. And our clear report will be coming out in August if that interests you. Um, looking specifically at library resources and use. Um, of pedagogy and collaboration with librarians. One thing I just want to start with though is uh, after a great keynote yesterday, um, the point came up that digital tools aren't an end in of themselves, but it's a way for us to help students recognize themselves, to insert themselves within this process of knowledge production, knowledge making. And I consider makerspace tools, laser cutters, um, Arduino, as well as 3D printing to be the most literal manifestation of knowledge production. And there's ways to get students to interact with objects to otherwise interpret complex uh, concepts. So some of the reasons I often get, why, not, why, why can't we 3D print? You know, we can't do it for a number of reasons. The first is that people think 3D printing is pretty much that it's over, saturated. Um, that's my baby shark. Um, and so that is the first thing I printed. He accidentally lost his arm on the one side, you know. <laughs> But they're fragile, they're neon, they're plastic, they're tchotchkes, right? And so some people say, how is this relevant to a class? How is this relevant to critical thinking? So I often hear their toys, and that's just not true. There's a number of different filaments now that I'll introduce throughout the presentation. Uh, you have metal composites, metal, clay, nylon, um, the castable resins, if you're working with things like um, lost wax method or um, casting jewelry and things like that. Um, lunar soil, right now the big thing is that NASA is trying to get a 3D printer up in space so that you can actually, um, they don't have to bring all materials for habitation, but rather you can produce them there. So a lot of really cool experimentation going on from everything from food to medicine right now. Um, and then also the, um, The way it's transforming not just medicine, um, aerospace, but also music, art, film. Recently, this film came out entirely done in stop motion animation using 3D printed objects. So, this is something transforming all fields and something that we can help our students think critically about at this early stage. The other point I often get is that it's too expensive or difficult to sustain and maintain, and that's also just not true. Um, there's a number of wonderful resources, skill development resources. And printers now are starting to be leased at $150. Can't vouch for them, I haven't tried those yet. Up through about $2,000, $3,000. And then, you know, the higher end, typically you just press a button and it goes. Uh, those are about $10,000. But really, you can get a great printer for a couple thousand dollars. One that is easy to maintain. So, the way that I conceive of how people can use 3D printing is product versus process. So why are you 3D printing and how do the students engage with the material that they're either using themselves or one that you've constructed for them? So the first is product. And for this, students engage with a customized 3D printed object. These are created products that are specifically made by faculty or staff ahead of time and intended to shape and enhance students' engagement with the first content. So it's something that's an object that students otherwise wouldn't have access to, a way to change their uh, approach to an object or a concept that is otherwise um, not feasible without the use of customized video printing, and one that you as an instructor can instructor can shape um, and contextualize. And so you have an active role in helping them understand its relevance to the first content. The second is process, and students engage with the process of 3D printing, uh, problem solving to overcome obstacles and engage with course content in new innovative ways. In this, students typically need to learn new skills. Remodeling, modeling, printing, iterative design, depending on what the point of the course is. 
And so these two different ways to engage with 3D printing are really helpful when trying to conceptualize how this fits into the study into our classroom. And then there's also both, and these are my favorite. Sometimes these involve a 3D printed object um, that's already been made and students do something creative with it, or um, they'll create something themselves and then give it to students to interact with um, on a multi-dimensional level. <coughs> So experiential learning is really important, uh, an important part of this because it helps students engage, interact with, um, experience, observe in different ways, uh, in different materials. And so experiential learning uh, is the process where that knowledge is created through the transformation of experience, so the transformation of the concept, the synthesis of ideas into a physical object, and the interpretation of that object into something new, this knowledge production. Uh, so this is where a lot of authentic learning experiences can happen, especially when I mentioned the fact that uh, all these fields are transforming because of 3D printing. So professional skill development and reflecting on your role as these knowledge producers in the future. So an example of something where you might produce something to give a different experience, a haptic experience, I traded out my biology example for chemistry in this case, uh, molecular models. And so in this case, we've got two professors from Davidson College 3D printer, it's a MakerBot. So MakerBot's $2,500. They learn how to do this entirely themselves in their lab. So this is something they purchased for themselves. What they decided to do was create their own models to represent very complex molecular relationships. And so this is just one of their designs. But what they're trying to do is help students understand what is otherwise this is flat two-dimensional diagrams. And so the students can turn them, flip them, compare them to other things. And so they get this haptic physical experience that they otherwise wouldn't have for objects that are too small to see. And they've been thrilled. They said that this is very successful, and their biggest problem right now is deciding what next to design and implement. This is from my own course at the University of Virginia. I did a Viking art and archaeology course. Um, and this was fantastic. This is when you get to play with some of those unusual composite materials to get the real authentic experience of touching, holding, you get the weight, you get the color, you get the vague material smell of the metal. Um, so typically you get an axe head, in this case, if I can reach axe head, you blow it up just like this on the screen. But in this case, you give it to the students, the students can hold it, touch it, experience it, identify it without a caption just like they would out in a natural archaeological site in comparison with other materials in class. And then over here on the right, you can see starting with plastic red, going all the way through uh, patina, a copper fill, um, a filament with copper powder and filling plastic, and then ultimately sulfur on the end, we used rotting eggs to get the sulfur look. It wasn't very pleasant, but in this <laughs> way, yeah, there were a lot of puns going on too about um, experiments. <laughs> yeah. um, but what's great about both of these is that they were available online. And so the models were actually scanned from the artifacts for the line, Creative Commons license, so that I was able to then use them, remix them, and students could experience them as if they were actually able to see real objects. This is the closest we can get with Viking artifacts in the United States without taking any of this kind of video. Um, so this was really wonderful and a great example, a great, um, a great uh, example of why we should be scanning these objects and making them available uh, to enhance education. We also have critical making, um, and this is a, a term coined fairly recently um, by Matt Reno, and it is the mode of materially productive engagement that is intended to bridge the gap between creative, physical, and conceptual exploration. That's wonderful. Basically, what he's saying is that we think the complex concepts through the act of doing and making. And so for him, this is marrying the idea of humanistic inquiry and critical thinking and engineering or artistic practices of iterative design. And so there's a number of ways this can manifest in the classroom. I'm an art historian by trade, so I have a lot of archaeology examples. And this one, this was at James Madison University. The students actually downloaded their own objects and went through the process of actually printing them themselves. This is absolutely relevant to the field right now, uh, as more and more monuments are not only being preserved through photogrammetry and laser scanning, digital models, but also then reconstructed to preserve, to save, to share objects that were otherwise destroyed in Syria. So in this case, she was able to walk the students through the process of cultural heritage and what that meant. 
what it meant in the future for these students as possible future scholars and archaeologists, and have them be quick and think critically about the pros and even the cons of what this technology offers the future. What they found is that a lot of times you have to manipulate the model to get it to print right, and so that's something that's not immediately apparent if you're just looking at something that exists in real life. So that was a very helpful uh, lesson for them to learn in this course. And this was also, um, just a note, these printers um, at James Madison were $800. So this idea that this is absolutely accessible to many people is, is absolutely true. Um, and again, just using this case where they were plastic rather than the composites. A little bit closer to home, St. Joseph's University. This is a great course uh, by David Perry. In this case, looking at information materiality and 3D printing and how this technology is changing our culture. In this course, we had one module that would be lectures, discussion, things like that. The other modules that would be the 3D printing in and of itself. And so through the process of 3D printing each week, developing skills not only with 3D printers, but also with designing, making their own objects, iterating on their design, improving their design, the students were able to think about how it shaped their own culture their own experience, especially with the internet and the free sharing of ideas. This printer, this printer was famous for about $300 to $800. So again, there's a lot of opportunities, um, very accessible. Yeah, this is a language course uh, that I helped with at the University of Virginia. Um, I earned the Russian, uh, of Russia exhibition. And so this was one of those good dual processing product ones. The students 3D printed something that existed already on the internet, um, in this case from Thingiverse, things that they thought represented Russia. And they did this early in the class. And the point was that they iterate not on their model, but on the exhibit of that information. And so the students actually had a tiny little window with little captions in the Slavic department where they had to change and shape the exhibit change their objects if needed as their concept of the Russianness began to change and transform over the course of the semester. And what was really wonderful about this is this tiny little bus of Stalin here ended up getting a lot of backlash um, because a lot of the Slavic professors thought that it promoted Stalin in some kind of glamorous fashion. Now, of course, it didn't. But this opened a great conversation, I think, that goes back to Perry's course about what is the purpose of these objects? What things are that freely accessible? What is an icon? What is an object? And do you support the values of something just because you can get it pretty clean and stick on your desk? Um, so it ended up being a great project, especially with comparing that to kids. Here, there's a book right here with Stalin's face on it and a, pho a photograph. So this idea that the photograph is somehow a scholarly pursuit and somehow the movement of a small object was not as a very fascinating conversation with the students. A few really exciting things, if you're interested and not quite sure maybe how to get started, how to initiate something like this on your campus. We just initiated the Innovative Teaching of the Makerspace Technology Grant at Temple University in collaboration with the Center for the Advancement of Teaching. And this ended up being wildly successful. We ended up having a number of great uh, applicants, uh, they get 35 up to $3,500. So we've had people try to do virtual reality, we've had people try to do 3D printing, but among the 3D printing projects, we're really excited. We have them from biology, medicine, architecture, and geography, all undergraduate courses. So product, you get give anatomical models that they can actually convert to a printable model, and then 3D print so students can engage with something that somebody just had one with them. Architecture, iterative design, so they can do quick changes, that quick turnaround being very important for that transformative educational experience. And then geography is working on taking visualizations of the networks and visualizing them in a physical way, in this case for Franklin Institute. So hopefully those will be great. So keep, keep uh, following along if you're interested. And then this is a project also a lot of museums have gotten involved in this. The Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh um, is doing a Hall of Architecture copy and paste. It's their plaster cast exhibit. And so we'll be working on actually having a copy shop, 3D printing, 3D, uh, the 3D printing little pens, uh, CNC node objects. And so a way to engage, in this case, not students, but the patrons of the museum to then better understand, in this case, a really excellent collection of casts. So just getting started really quickly to end this up, if you're interested at all. Look for three 
printing services at your institution. This can include an expert, this can include a library, it might be a studio, it might be an engineer. Look for their equipment and someone to help you get started if you don't know how to get started. You want to think about the relevance of this to your course, and that's why the product versus process I think is very helpful. How much time do you want students to spend learning skills? How much time do you want them to, to engage with an object and content rather than a process? And so in order to figure this out, I often uh, recommend people do some sort of alignment. So start with the learning objective first, rather than just tack on a 3D printing assignment so it's clear what the students are behind. Scaffolding and skill development. So if you're doing a process-related class, you want to think about how to make other small assignments as you go so that students don't just get this final <laughs> project and get really stressed out about it. And so part of this constructive alignment also Putting in this evaluation and assessment in these scaffolding assignments, the students are ready and prepared for their final project. Evaluation. Always do a print first. If you don't know how much effort it takes to do one of these assignments, you can't really evaluate how the student's end product is. And in a lot of cases, for me, when I had the students interact with those objects, I had them write a paper, in this case, an exhibit catalog. So they were still doing writing, some of them were more familiar with evaluating, but you might also want to evaluate objects if they're created as well. And finally, the number of students, because this will affect time and cost. Um, always very important for materials. Some institutions offer free 3D printing. Sometimes it's cheaper for you to buy a school yourself. Um, but there's ways to get around large courses. Our largest course, for that grant, has 100 students. We're going to do group projects. And so it's a way to get students engaging with this process, in this case, with our two very small limited that we have right now. And then finally, be flexible and be open to learning yourself. This is my first failed print. Very disappointing. Um, but it happens, and that's part of the fun. We as instructors become students and we learn from our students. And that's probably the best part about this is that we engage in their active knowledge production. And it might make us a little uncomfortable, but that's the best and most exciting part of learning. Thank you.